Good morning, holy brethren. Now I'm on the other end of the live stream. <laughs> I appreciate when you all speak that you include us and greet us. This, this means a lot to us. It's good to be knit together in these things. I rejoice to be here. I rejoice to bring you the, uh, a report of the section of the land that I've been able to spy out. My text, main text is from Hebrews 4, too. I do want to read uh, some text around that, To I know you all are familiar with this, so this is, this is good to jump right into. But here's what I want to affirm, uh, and, I, and, and don't judge it ahead of time. We'll go all the way through, and then you'll see. What we want to do, or what I want to do in my exposition this morning, is showcase the effectuality of the gospel in a wilderness setting. See, now we're in a wilderness setting now. The text talks about them in the wilderness, but so are we. So it's then and now to showcase the effectuality of the gospel. This is God's intention. It's not something that just snuck up. Also, we want to reason upon God's ministry to Israel and not on their response. See, the ministry was good to them. Their response didn't match God's good ministry to them. But that's why it's given as a warning. We're in the, we're in the same category, in a sense, in that way, too. God's ministry through the gospel is good to you and to me. And our response is to be like. And then we want to rejoice in the productive stance of new creatureship. We have a great advantage. We do. In this current wilderness setting, we're in Christ. So we rejoice in this. I want to pick up the reading. Hebrews is hard to, to jump in, as it were. You know, it's, so, it's such a tight weave. But at the, toward, toward the middle of chapter 3 is where I want to begin. The, the comparisons of Christ and other things or other persons in the gospel of, or rather in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, you remember he and Moses, Christ and Moses are being set side by side. And as the author comes out of that area, in verse 7, he says, wherefore, and then the whole next several verses are parenthetical. So not that you would skip them, but he's hearkening back in his wherefore. Let me do it this way. In verse 7, wherefore... And then verse 12 is where he picks up. Wherefore, take heed, brethren. See? But he's bringing their minds back to something that happened before. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, tested me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Wherefore, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. See, he keeps coming back to this. Today. So anytime we talk and hear, it's today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's still with us. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, here, here comes the chorus again, it is still today. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? See, it's not all, but it was with them that had sinned. Their sin was their unbelief. They didn't take hold of this good word. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So, it's concluding now, we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why not? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. See how far they got? They even heard it. But it wasn't mixed with faith. For we which have believed do enter into rest. This is the other side. There is, there is a work of God, and this is what the gospel does. It continues this work. Men are able to enter into God's rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, 
although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So again, this is God's intention and design from the get-go. And let's talk about that. The first word of God, bearing gospel intent, was actually delivered in that first garden, Eden. Actually spoken during the cursing of the serpent. It was good news, and it was overheard by Adam and Eve. Certainly it was not comprehended in the fullness that we enjoy now with the apostles' revelation upon it. Yet it did proffer hope for those two who shortly thereafter were, were to be driven out into a wilderness setting also. They were driven out of the garden, outside Eden, where the ground was cursed. It would bring forth thorns and thistles, and from which in sorrow they would eat, toiling and sweat all the days of their life until their bodies returned to the dust. But when God spoke in that word, it was, his speaking was, con was concerning a dramatic future event. Remember where he talked about the seed and the seed? It was something that maybe they didn't, well, surely they didn't know all the considerations involved in it. But he was, God was forecasting a triumphant bruising. And thus, a, tri a reversal of sin's horrible impact from which they were just coming out. So the power of God unto salvation was present unto them. In other words, if they would take that word that he said and believe that, that would sustain them. That's that power that we're talking about. This promise involving a conflict between two seeds, the woman's and the serpent's, was actually like a planting of a seed itself. I'm going to show how the gospel is like the planting of a seed and how it grows and brings forth fruit from the beginning of time all the way up until the present. So this seed of promise would sprout, grow, flourish, over time developing into a mature planting of the Lord. The seed of note, now I'm, now I'm using a capital S, the seed of note, see it's, it's again narrowed down to one man, would grow it before him out of a dry ground as a tender plant. But then a most remarkable fruit bearing would follow. It, wa it wasn't just fruitage to look at, to, in to enjoy to, as a display, but rather Jesus foretelling his own death and subsequent resurrection unto fruitfulness, he spoke this way, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it does, it brings forth much fruit. So the marvel of salvation and the stamp of effectuality as a work of God is that the fruit bearing is flourishing in a wilderness setting. It is. The heart of faith in which God works is denoted in this parable of the good ground, the, the different soils. But the good ground talks about the good heart, the one that receives the word and, and grows up. But remember, that wasn't the only ground there. That growth of that seed in the good ground was taking place amidst other grounds, too. There were other displays. Initial seed sproutings were faltering by reason of persecution, deceitful riches, cares, lusts of this world. Or maybe, maybe just the wicked one was lingering nearby to snatch that seed up. What are the odds of survival in such a harsh environment? Well, it's a good thing the gospel doesn't work on the odds basis. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work that way. The gospel doesn't work by chance or, any, or on any probability sequence that men can dream up. But, but the gospel of God does work, can work, and it does work effectuality in the wilderness because God has ordained it so. This is his purpose. He implements his handiwork in those who participate by faith. Not only does it work, that's kind of a small word to even talk about it that way, the gospel works. It does more than that. It flourishes and abounds. It's most eager to bless its recipients during their sojourn through their region of apparent disadvantage. Early on, th think, just think back. Like, like Here's how I do it a lot of times. I go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and that gives you like the high points of the, the ones in the, the, you know, the halls of faith. Early on and very often through the scriptural record, God demonstrated his willingness and ability to do his work among men in wilderness environments, men of his choosing. So often, it wasn't just accidental, it might be noted then as his proclivity or preference to operate in these settings. Think about that. Although men seek to provide for themselves a favorable and comfortable venue of labor, God is not limited or restricted by weakness of flesh. His purposing acting and completing flow from his boundless nature. Consider the words of Isaiah, the Lord God will come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. 
you're familiar with chapter 40 of Isaiah, a wonderful chapter. And as it tends toward the end of the chapter, it says, The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. So, so what happens? Those that enter into this by faith and take hold of what God has said, they eventually fly. They walk, they run, they fly. Consider the old covenant saints then and their assigned fields of ministry. And I've just touched on a few. You, you can search this out in your own thinking too. Noah was called out in a singular manner from among all of mankind to construct the ark as a type of salvation by faith when judgment falls. Abraham and Sarah with him, he was called out from his country, his kindred, his father's house to an unknown, at least to him, land where he would dwell in tents. And then Isaac and Jacob with him, the fathers of the formation of a nation were called out from all the rest of the world. So here you had the putting it together of a nation in whom and eventually they would be in a literal wilderness setting. We'll get to that in a little bit. Joseph cast into a pit in the wilderness, drawn out to enter the wilderness of slavery, unjust treatment, imprisonment, and estrangement from his family. Moses, by faith, he forsook Egypt, esteeming the reproaches of Christ. Isn't that, isn't that good how, they, how the Holy Spirit puts that? Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. So he had 40 years of wilderness training with sheep, followed by 40 years of wilderness experience with people. See, so God puts men and women in these wilderness categories in, other, in order to test and to prove and to build them. And, and they flourish in these environments by faith. Written of Moses, Stephen, in the book of Acts chapter 7, comments in this way, again, talking about Moses, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. These are called out ones. With the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai. What about David? Remember his brother, he meant this as a derisive comment, Eliab. He said, with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? But he was well occupied while he was with those few sheep in the wilderness, was he not? During that time, he slew a lion and a bear to prepare for Goliath. And then later on, while a refugee from those who sought his life in various wilderness areas of Israel and Philistine territory, he was actually being prepared to rule a mighty nation, nation of Israel, and receive God's promise concerning himself and his seed, seed of David, of the eternal king. These ones I've named and more, prophets, priests, people, the time would fail me, Hebrews, the Hebrew writer says, to tell of the saints living by faith. They were ones that wandered, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. They wandered in deserts, mountains, and in caves and dens of the earth. God, having provided, though, some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect or complete. So you see, God is not... This is not a, we're not making a separation between the Old Covenant and New Covenant saints in the way that they come into rest. They come in by believing in what God has said, whether it be in a, what seems to be an easy setting or not. But most often, it's in a wilderness setting. We note in this the continuity of God's purpose and working, and therefore, when God purposes something, he's going to do it. And so he works it. And he, it doesn't matter what setting it's in, he's going to work it. And it actually brings more glory to his name when it's in something that would seem like it couldn't work, couldn't flourish, but it does. It's not that the, it's not that the gospel itself has changed. I'm not trying to say that. I'm not trying to say there was a gospel in the old covenant times and a different one now. But it certainly has been developed in man's understanding through the course of verse timetable this has taken place. What was revealed to Adam, to Noah, to David, and the others was intended by God as sufficient and proper for their time. And in, in the same way, those things that are revealed to Paul, Peter, the apostles, and eventually us were matched unto our season also. The gospel to each in turn was appropriate for their times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. 
In other words, they were synchron God synchronized things in this way. Amen. Each ministration was guaranteed effectual by looking, though, to one work, that final work of redemption and the coming Redeemer. That's why when the writer in the Hebrews here, when he wraps this all together, he gets over and he says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. This is, this is where it's all brought together. But the gospel was developed, as it were. I, I know you probably don't think about it this way with digital cameras and all, but in the old, and I don't know a whole lot about this, so don't hold me to it, but when you developed a, a photograph, it had to be in a, like a dark room. And it was, but it became clearer later when you brought it out into the light. So that's the gospel had a development process, as it were. It takes on dimension, clarity, color, character. What first were just broad out outlines were now, over time, they're sharpened. Contrasts are defined. Amen. Fuzzy images are snapped to life. So this is not to say that the development occurred in God's purposing. We don't want to say that. God's design has never changed. But because of who he's working with and what he's working with, it took some time. Certainly in its implementation and revelation, because of God's long suffering and consideration of these created frames of dust, the, the gospel has been developed in our understanding. Now, we, our text in Hebrews is talking about a time of a particular time of the Israelites in the wilderness. When they came out of Egypt, it was not a whole lot longer that they came up to the land of Canaan and the spies were sent in. But then remember they had to detour round and round and round for a certain amount of time. So the, this account is reasoned upon by the apostles particularly. This account of Israel in the wilderness is the most prominent recurring example related to the pilgrimage of New Covenant saints. The journey was essentially from bondage in Egypt, typifying a life of servitude to sin, unto the provision of the promised land of blessing and rest. The representation from Israel then to the Israel of God now, not all these representations are meant to transfer directly across. See, they're not, we're, not, we're not supposed to take this and say this is exactly like it is now. That's not the point. But the direction is the same. The work of God is the same. So those are the, the high points that we want to see. They're not meant to be exact crossovers or entirely parallel in meaning. There are distinctions of similarity and dissimilarity. Why is that? There's a covenantal supervision that's taken place. There's a difference, see? But God's the supervisor. It's at God's discretion. The new is always revelatory of the old in, in all of its aspects. With due regard to the superiority of new covenant capability, though we don't want to neglect the alignment of both, that which is presented as a gospel in the Old Covenant. What, what did they hear? What did they hear? Well, they heard a word from God, a sufficient word, and what we have now. Let us then not neglect the alignment of both unto the timely fulfillment of the whole counsel of God. See, we're, we're at the end. We're in the last days, but we're in the right place too. That's good. The remembrance of Israel's wanderings are brought to the forefront of exhortations by Paul. There's, there are three main places. These are not the only ones. These are the ones that, we're, that, that I know you all are familiar with. In chapter 10 of first, the first letter to the Corinthians, and then also Jude, just in verse 5, he mentions it in his trilogy of judgments. He talks about Israel and the angels and, and uh, Sodom. But here we're looking at a very lengthy section of this in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. And this text to the Hebrews deals at length with the example of Israel in the wilderness as a past record of the failure of flesh to proceed by faith. Thus, exhorting hearers now, in Paul's day and now, to believe the gospel of God's work in Christ Jesus because he is the one that has furnished the table in the wilderness. Some have made the mistake of declaring new covenant believers just like Israel well, like in some ways, it is true that we're on a pilgrimage. It is true it's through a desert region. But not just like. For 40 years, they wandered. Why? To weed out the unbelievers. Yeah. New Covenant pilgrims are noted, though, for wearing the whole armor of God and overcoming the world by faith, not for wandering. So, so it is a wilderness setting, but it's, but it's like a more of a direct route. 
Not a shortcut, but a direct route. Amen. Remember, not, not all of them fell by unbelief. I appreciated this song we had a little while ago. I had never seen or sung that before with Caleb and Joshua. See, not all of them fell. Some lived by faith. Some came in, and they were the stronger for it. Forty years later, they were actually more vigorous, it seemed. Not all professors, though, of this age will finish their course if they draw back in unbelief. See, what was, what was true about them then is true now. Unbelief still prevents from entering into God's rest. Thus, the apostle, by the Holy Spirit, seizes upon this early example of Israel to testify of danger and to minister to those in Christ. Let me go ahead and read a little bit further in the text. This is chapter 4 of Hebrews, continuing on in verse 4. For he, that's God, or that's actually the author of, uh, that's Moses, this would be. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day in this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And that's back in Genesis, of course. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. See, he's, he's like touching down at different points in history. He's saying, God, God let you know this from the beginning, but you didn't get it all. You didn't see it all. And when you, when you came into Canaan, those of you that even made it, that wasn't all of it either. There's more. So he's bringing it up to date. There remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth or he defines or he shows you in a certain place, this is Psalm 95, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for if Jesus, that's Joshua, had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. If they entered the final rest about which the Sabbath was speaking and about which God was ministering early on, then how come when the people of Israel that made it into Canaan came there, why didn't they just stop talking about it? Well, that wasn't all. That was like another overlay to show them what God was going to do in Christ Jesus in the fullness of the gospel. That's the time in which we live. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, all the people of God. We're not excluded and neither are they. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. I, I really appreciate the way that the author has come out with this. Now, these are not things that Moses wrote about, let us. He didn't write, let us, exhortations. Do, his was more on the order of, do this, yeah. or else. <laughs> but here we have, let us therefore fear, let us labor to enter the rest, let us hold fast our profession. Hey, you see the progression? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. And then over in chapter 6, let us go on to perfection. So this, this is the ministration of the gospel now. See how it has a forward look and a forward action to it. Amen. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. See, I want that rest. That's the, that's the rest he's talking about. And the warning still is attached to it. It's hinged to it. Lest any man should fall after the same example of unbelief. Why is that? We're in a wilderness. Unbelief is around. It has the, it has the occasion to trip you up. And yet... The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to all who believe. Amen. So this language in Hebrews 4.2, he's, he's, he's going back and forth. The word preached, the gospel preached unto them, unto us. It sets in a new light some misunderstood and therefore misapplied terminology. Not everyone, when they say the word gospel, is talking about the same thing. And even here, as the author brings it in, he's, not, he's talking about the same, he's talking about a word of God, but the way that it's said, the way that it comes to you, is, is different than it from Israel unto now. The words used are descriptive of manners of God in his dealings with man. That's why you could apply it then and apply it now. What is perceived as preaching the gospel today can hardly be applied to those led by Moses through the desert land. I mean, can you imagine Paul saying what he said? They, they had no footings for it. They had no foundation for it. But the foundation had to be laid then so that Paul could minister the way he did. It is God that is the worker in both covenants. Men are the substance or the material of both manifestations. 
The effectuality and the superior nature of the new covenant work is the accomplishment of a better rest. There's been a better rest accomplished in Christ than Moses and Joshua could ever deliver. But this is a rest into which believing men can enter. So the writer to the Hebrews, Paul no doubt, has joined the old covenant circumstance with new covenant terminology on purpose. Moses didn't note the words that Israel of old received as the gospel. You won't find where Moses wrote about a gospel like that. But he did tell them things from God. Paul did use the, words, the word gospel. This is in light of what God was accomplishing during the tenure of the law in anticipation of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by grace and truth would fulfill all the types, all the shadows in his own person. He wasn't, he wasn't merely going through the routines of, well, I've got to do that and accomplish that, and here's a prophecy that I've got to accomplish. No, he himself, it flowed from him. This is who he was. The bringing together in the text of them and us was to highlight the continuity of God's work. And at the same time, it was going to illustrate the remaining danger of an earthly setting, the wilderness. As oft noted by, this, by the Hebrew writer, a greater access to God, he uses this word greater a lot in Hebrews, a greater access to God through the gospel of Christ coincides with a greater risk to the participants. Look how many warnings are given in Hebrews. To whom much is required, or much is given, much is required. And here's one from Hebrews. We ought to give the more earnest heed to those things which we have heard. So the wilderness is still perilous, but the gospel is ever the power of God unto salvation. Whether it be from physical earthly enemies or in our time, principles, there, there are some now, I don't deny that. But in our time, it mostly is in the realm of principalities, powers, indwelling sin. See, these are, the, these are the nature of our enemies. But the gospel will save us from those. Salvation out of Egypt was then, in this way, incomplete. In other words, just getting out wasn't enough. God wasn't, in, God wasn't interested in just getting out, but rather getting in, getting them in to somewhere else. It lacked the finality and safety that would be evidenced at their arrival in Canaan. So the wilderness itself was and is not the goal. Rather, it's a realm of testing and proving. Remember how God said that? He said, I, I put you there in the wilderness for that reason. Same with us. It's a, it's a time of testing and proving. Man, and in a sense, God. We prove God to be true in our wilderness. He proves himself to be true to us. But a word of God then would sustain one who received it and walked in faith. For, as we've already mentioned, Caleb and Joshua, they flourished. They were profited. Why? They mixed with faith that word given them. Concerning God's desire and ability to bring them into a land of milk and honey. So the gospel, one way to put this is, is it's an accommodation. Actually, it's more than that. More accurately, it would be a divine provision to sustain in a wilderness. You have to have it if you're a pilgrim and a stranger, or you won't make it through. Provision for them, Israel, consisted largely of physical things. Remember the cloud and the, and the fire? So they had shade in the day. They had the fire, warmth, and light at night. They had manna every day. They had water, whether it be from the 70 palms or from a rock. They had organic clothing, for lack of a better word. It grew with them. And shoes that did not wear out. Life more abundantly in Christ Jesus is somewhat different. It is supplied from riches and glory. But it is able to bring to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now here, here again, back to this, a warning in the text. For unto us was the gospel preached. This is not a historical passage with no barb or point to it. It's to be taken into consideration to make your calling and your election sure. So this warning in the text was of the same nature as warnings to Israel. Let us therefore fear, he says. They were thoroughly admonished concerning their departure also from God's commands. Remember how they had 
the cursings and the blessings and the things if they if if they did this then surely God would continue with them but if not this is the writer of the Hebrews is letting us know that God has not changed in his desire that men enter into his word and his in his work then the warning is not itself the gospel we want to make that distinction see what I mean just going out and telling people if you don't do such and such or even if you don't go through a routine or pray or whatever you do see that's not the gospel itself the power is a declaration about what God has done but this warning and all of them all the warnings and ex exhortations and admonitions they serve like an orbital purpose so they work around the gospel they're held together by the gravity of good news what holds you to the good news is God himself and who you are and you've been changed but but there's also this like this uh, word surrounding and going around that is saying don't come out here so he's giving a warning like that to the Hebrews the gospel though is at all times a declaration of God's willing and able administration of his purpose now you have several components in salvation I I hesitate even to say it that way but you'll see what I mean because he's working through and he's using God's word you have God you have men some believing some unbelieving and you have the gospel but all have to be present and active in some way so that men would be saved and brought near to God so in salvation God the gospel and believing men are each and all present at the inception of the work and unto its completion the wilderness arena can be a distraction we see how it was can be now but it has been deemed by God as the field of choice for his glory I like that see so don't don't be discouraged brethren it took the larger bulk of time 4,000 years or so from creation to the incarnation from Adam to Christ to extract the benefit intended from this revelation that we have here in Hebrews 4:4. What did they? What did what did Moses know, or what did the early ones even before Moses Moses know about the uh, seventh day? God rested from all his labor. See, this didn't really have a, a touch point with them, and even later it was. Well, did it apply here, or did it apply here, or what is this? God resting on the seventh day, though, was unto a rest unveiled now in the apostles' writing a rest that was not fully available or even obtainable until the putting away of the sin of the world see the, so there was a rest that you could enter to enter into by believing God but then God was going to like ratify what he had said and done before time the rest where Israel rested by coming into Canaan was incomplete actually it was often unwilling every seven days they had to stop whether they wanted to or not at risk of death right remember the man gathering sticks so their rest was incomplete it was a forced Sabbath imposed upon recalcitrant hearts they couldn't receive they wouldn't receive they wouldn't receive they couldn't receive doesn't matter it didn't come to them they didn't receive it as a good word a gospel word demonstrating the incompatibility of flesh to really enter into God's rest it, it really won't flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God the promise though of a final and enduring rest is perceived in a rest from our own labors to enter into an accomplished rest yeah. not that you've come to a point where you can rest in it but you've come to a point where you can enter into it the rest is accomplished for you yeah. Christ accomplished it for God and we enter in the word unto us surpasses then in value the gospel unto them in terms of its immediate result or benefit see if they received the word they entered into Canaan but you receive far more yes, the means though of taking hold by faith of God's word or God's promise in any generation is that which is approved and received by God as a demonstration of an entry into his work or his rest so what we take hold of now is superior because of the time and place we've been set in but it's still God speaking and still men entering by faith so you see we're talking dissimilarity and similarity these are put together profiting may look or seem different then and now 
but it always has to do with the reception of the gospel. Meanwhile, we're journeying through a wilderness. The gospel preached to Israel was like or unlike that, both. It was like in some fashion and unlike in other ways, that which we know today. Israel was an appropriate people for the message given to them by God. In other words, what he said to them was fitted to them where they were at in time and who they were, as are we. The gospel they heard, though, was in a sense primitive, early, um, a prototype of the, the greater to follow. Remember how Hebrews talks about better promises? But God would credit their belief to them, bringing them surely the prophet he promised them. So we reason upon this and know that he will bring us also the prophet he has promised us. In the them and us comparison here in Hebrews, though, there is a parallel dynamic working according to God's progressive timetable. This is important. The things received by them were not the same as those received by the ones in Paul's day and even further now, really, in our day. But the results are synchronized according to divine revelation. What God made known, he expected men to enter into. And they could by means of the gospel. Because he was speaking to them, that in itself was the accommodation for them to enter in. Here are, here are some similarities, though. The place where men are hearing this gospel or this word is always a place of danger, peril, but it's en route to a final rest. Also, there are always travelers that are acquainted with God. Those in Israel were acquainted with God in his ways, or at least his works. Now we are acquainted with God in a much higher fashion. So we can, they live by faith, the ones that proceeded, but we also live by faith, but we have, as it were, more to work with, more to, more to reason upon. But we are travelers as they. And the gospel, is, the gospel is noted in both circumstances. The gospel, a promise. In either case, it was made known. It was preached. It was declared to them and to us. And then there's a destination, a rest, attained in any case through belief. So failure to enter for them and for us is not attributed to impossibility. Right. See, it's not. You can't look back and say, well, they didn't enter because they were in Old Covenant times and they just couldn't do it. Well, some did. Scripture notes that. Some did. See? Nor is, it, nor is failure to enter attributed to the incompatibility of the gospel in, in the Old Covenant times. In other words, the gospel wasn't enough to get them far enough, so they just couldn't... They couldn't make the bar, as it were, and they just fell away. No, because not all of them did. Failure is always found outside the door of faith. See, those who enter through the door of faith, they do enter into the work that the gospel is achieving. Yeah. Hebrews 3 notes that God was grieved with that generation. Now, it's somewhat applied to the generation. When you think of generation, you may think of a time period. Then I believe it was those that were 20 years old and upward. But more specifically, generation speaks to a class or a group of people that are alike in their relation to God. For example, there it was applying to people with a notable heart condition of unbelief. That's the generation. So that generation is still excluded from God's rest. An evil heart of unbelief is not excusable in any period of, a, of time. The writer recalls and reaffirms the opportunity and necessity of believing and receiving now. That's why he keeps saying today, if you hear his voice. It's like God's chorus. Men sing verses through time, and God supplies the chorus today, if you hear his voice. Today, if you hear his voice. From this, we determine that a gospel word preached is compatible with a receptivity by faith in the hearing of any and all generations. Otherwise, God would be a respecter of personages. How, let's think about this. What exactly is the gospel preached in the wilderness? Does it have uh, words to it? Well, you, you, can, you can think long time on this. I didn't want to get too far into this and make it this is where it is and this is that. But remember what God said to Moses early on, even before he went to Egypt and told the elders there what God was going to do. This is in Exodus chapter 3. The Lord said, 
I have surely seen the afflictions of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land. It's not enough, that's not all, unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now this was retold to Moses. God reminded Moses of this on numerous occasions and in varied forms. You remember there were times when, when the people actually discouraged Moses in the way. And God reminded him of his work that he was about. Moses relayed this promise to the people. Some of them believed initially, but they were like a starting and stopping and starting and stopping. So initial response or belief didn't carry them through. The initial believing didn't carry them through. They had, in other words, they had to keep believing all the way. Repeated confirmations by deliverances and miraculous provision failed to inoculate them against unbelief. Now this is important because this is what's taught or at least is thought a lot of times in our day. If you've, if you've said or done a certain thing whereby you've entered into some knowledge of God or believed in him as men say, then you're inoculated against any further danger. So this is not true. Amen. A continual and a consistent mixing with faith was and is the only means of entering God's rest. Now, what permits the apostle to set up this comparison? I'm speaking as a man. Obviously, the Holy Spirit had him write it this way. But here he's placing the word spoken to Israel right next to, in proximity with, that preached in his own time, Paul's time. After, he's, now, he's saying this after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, after his ascension, after a major shift of focus in God's dealing with man, that was scheduled by the bringing in of the new covenant. So there must be a reason. There must be some strong similarities and some foundational constants that he needed to make his point. And, and there were, and he did. This is a point of warning, admonition, and his warning, as common in his ministrations, is paired, though, with a good word of hope and comfort. See, he doesn't just warn them and then go on. That's how the apostle writes. That, that's how the new covenant works. You, you come up to the edge and you see it and you say, well, I'm, I don't want that. The Lord's worked in me and, and he has a good word for me. And so that's what energizes you to continue and to, to leave that situation which is dangerous. So his admonition here, or his warning, is paired with a good word of hope and comfort because a successful navigation of the wilderness dangers is dependent upon God's work and entering into it. We see that God is the same to them and to us. He is the primary unchanging one. We see that man is the same, and yet he's different. Well, how, how is he the same? Well, he's same in the sense that he's in Adam when he's born. But we see that he's different in this day and age in the sense that sins have been put away. So there's been a work by God which has enabled him to take hold of more by faith and to proceed farther and wider in living. The gospel is the same and yet different, see? So in the, in the old covenant, I'm not, I'm not trying to make the distinction. There's not an old covenant and a new covenant gospel. The, but the gospel being the word of God was given and assigned to each section in time. So the gospel is developed, as it were, as mankind is exposed to the work and word of God. We're, we're in a day of very sharp focus. So this is a time called the last days when he's speaking in his son the words and deeds of his son we know all the words that he spoke and all the things that he did could not be contained in books if the world were full of them so he's still speaking is what we're saying so this this knowledge of the gospel now is being developed in you by looking unto Jesus the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ so this is, this is where this development takes place in you and I. So did those in Old Covenant times get stuck with the short end of the stick? I say no. Maybe an early end of the stick, but certainly not the short end. They without us, the scripture says, are not made perfect or complete. Together, together, all those who have lived and, and will live after we're gone by faith are going to exhibit the wisdom of God 
as we are Christ's church and are soon to be his bride. God's work and thus his one gospel is contiguous. This is a word that means touching or adjacent to. You're touching them, they're touching you, but God is overall. See, it's a, it's a contiguous work. All of its administrations and constituents have an interrelatedness, a bearing the one upon the other, an interwoven design by God. So the gospel then is not a mere invitation, though surely men are summoned to partake of God's goodness. Were it so, this good news of the gospel would be variable dependent upon you or I. Did you receive it or not? See, the gospel wouldn't really be good news. It might be to you one day, but not the next. But it's always good news because it's a word of God. Good news is always so, and particularly to those who are hearing it from the climate of a wilderness. The gospel is a presentation of God's activity accompanied with his command to repent based upon the impending judgment by the resurrected Christ. The perfecting and joining work of the gospel in believing men is in a forward and a progressive manner. We never go backward to improve. So the wilderness experience is a transitional movement. Now is superior to then in regards to purpose, to provision, to potential, and also to the ultimate position to be attained. We're not working to get into a geographical land somewhere, brethren. We're entering God's rest that we may be actually with him. Sin caused a driving out, an exit from the presence of the Lord. Now that's a hopeless wilderness. So that's a little different wilderness than what we're, the text is speaking of. God's purposing, though, brought a leading out into a wilderness of his formation. He brought them out of Egypt. He brings you out of a wilderness of sin, but he brings you right into another wilderness. So he brings you into a place where he can work with you and where he will. A people, whether they be led by Moses or led by Christ, that's the comparison set up here in chapter 3, in order to what? In order to focus attention upon his word alone. That's what Brother Gene was speaking about. His word alone. It's the only word. The only word of salvation. So the conclusion that we receive from this is that a wilderness tenure can separate man from God or alternately, by faith, it can bring him into the nearest proximity to God. And that's what we have in the New Covenant. We've come into the nearest proximity. We're still in a wilderness of sorts, but we're nearer to God by Jesus Christ. He, he's, he's actually bringing you to God in his person. Think of this example, too. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah each of them having spent 40 days in a wilderness sequester. Uh, if you think back, you know, Jesus, it was the temptation. He was driven up into the wilderness. Moses had just been up in the mount 40 days. And Elijah, I believe this was after um, Mount Carmel. I, I don't remember exactly. But each of them had just spent the 40 days and actually not eating. In other words, there, there, was, a very, there was a time of very intense working by God with them. But each returned triumphant from a barren and hostile environment to serve. Each one returned with vigor. Each one returned with a renewed, they were renewed and they were strengthened by their acquaintance with God in that wilderness. The wilderness then, in conjunction with the ministry of the gospel, is not an accidental or temporary assignment. We, we don't bemoan ourselves that we're in a difficult environment. We actually, like Paul, we rejoice in it. Rather, our wilderness is made to be a divine proving ground, a coliseum of peril and opportunity. It is a no man's land. You know what that is? That's like where you're not there, but you're not here yet. <laughs> so you're, you're in trouble if you're not watching out what's going on. It's a no man's land between where we once were and where we're going. So what does he say? He says, take up your cross and follow me. He went through it too. Consider those whose carcasses fell in the wilderness as the old man, those who lived after the flesh. But consider the maturing ones brought into Canaan as the new man, those born after the spirit. So you see that when we're in a wilderness, time must pass for this sloughing off of the old and the building up of the new. It's a preparation time. 
The wilderness is the time of preparation for which the gospel is the great facilitator. The gospel calls the shots, says what needs to go, what needs to stay. It tells the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. So the old is thus serving the new at its own expense and eventual demise until such time as your entry is prepared. The flesh itself profits nothing in regards to favor with God or as a source of salvation, but here you see flesh fulfilling its role as an unwilling servant to house this spirit and this new heart during our time on the potter's wheel. Paul said, I keep my body under. He said, I keep under my body. What he's saying is I, I keep it down. I, rest, I restrain it. I don't let it have the upper hand. Under what? Under who? Well, under the control of the truth, the gospel, the word of God. What animates the new man? Having found for sure that God's grace was sufficient for him, that being testified by the gospel promise, Paul concluded that infirmities, reproaches, distresses, and the like were workers that were assigned for him by God in the wilderness. So, in conclusion, brethren, when the final representation of Adam is fallen, those in Christ will enter eternally into regions of promise and glory. Amen. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Amen. Amen.